Good morning. Thank you for that introduction, Mark. Uh, he made it sound a lot more official uh, when I got the, the job offer from him. He uh, DM'd me on Instagram and he said, you ready to move to Texas? And I said, I guess so. Uh, so yeah, now I've been here for nine months and the church at Wood Forest has just become my home. Uh, I truly love it here so, so much. I love pouring into your students from middle school to high school. It's just, it's really just the honor of my life to be able to do that. Every single day I wake up and I find such joy in being able to love these students with the same love that I found in Jesus Christ. Um, and before we dive into the message today, I just wanna honor Mark Swayze because he is an incredible leader. I know y'all heard his title, Director of Next Gen Ministries. And for y'all, I'm sure you're like, what does that even mean? And trust me, we're, we're still trying to figure out the same thing because we don't really know what it means. But here's the truth is that each and every single day in the United States of America, more and more young people are leaving the church. And if we as a church don't focus on young people, pouring into them, believing in them, then they are going to leave. And I think there is such a call on Mark's life to bring young people back into the church. It's like an apostolic anointing to say, no, young people, you're not gonna leave. We're gonna put you in positions in ministry where you're gonna pour into others. You're gonna be different than we are. We're gonna uplift the next generation from children's all the way to college. We're gonna uplift these young people. And Mark has done that in such a beautiful way to where a 22-year-old guy like me, who every other church said I needed experience to get a job, and I'm like, I just graduated college, how am I gonna have experience? That's impossible, it doesn't work like that. Um, and Mark said, no, I, I trust you, I know that God's gifted you to do this, and it's changed my life forever. So he's gifting young people like me opportunities like this, and it's changing our community, changing the culture at this church. So just thankful for Mark this morning. If y'all could just give a little hand clap for Mark, that'd be great. So we are going through the Gospel of John. If you don't have your little booklet, you can pull your little booklet out. I love that we're doing this. I think this is such a beautiful thing for us to do where we're not gonna preach a topical sermon series. We're not gonna try and entertain you. Like we are going to preach the Gospel and like it's incredible. Like it doesn't need anything added onto it. We're just telling the Word of God as it is. And I truly love this book. It's just so, I just feel like they did such a good job with it. Our creative our creative media department did such a good job doing this. And the picture on the front of this, um, if you didn't know, is the woman at the well, which is found in John chapter four. And I wanna recap that because last week, our missions pastor came in and live streamed a sermon for us um, about missions and about giving. And I will have to say, if you didn't get a chance to listen to that message last week, I would go back and listen to it because it was one of the best messages I've ever heard on giving in my life. And I know you're like, it's giving. I'm not gonna listen to a giving message. No, like this was a really good giving message about leaving the margins of your life for the people that need it. Because if every, single in the, if every single person in our church left margins for the people that are hurting in our church, then there wouldn't be any hurting people in our community anymore if we all left margins. And that message was so good. She did such a good job about that. Anyway, but because of that, we were not able to cover John 4. We said a little prayer about it, but I wanna give you a bit of context to what happened in John 4. So at John 4, Jesus meets this woman in Samaria, this woman at the well. And when he comes to the woman at the well, he basically tells her everything that's happened in her life. And she's like, who is this person? Is he a prophet? He's truly the son of God. He's the Messiah. And one thing that he says that is so important is he says something about the fact that she is settling for temporary water. She's settling for water that will leave her thirsty again, water that is gonna run dry eventually. And what he offers her is this eternal life, this eternal water that is truly found in Jesus, truly found in him. So I believe that gives us a bit of context to where we're at today in John chapter five, because we find ourselves around another body of water today in John five. We found ourselves at the pool of Bethesda. And before we read through this John five real quick, I wanna just want just we're just gonna break it down. We're just gonna dive into it. I just wanna say a, a quick prayer real quick, just so we focus our minds, focus our hearts, and are ready to receive the, receive the word of God, okay? So would you bow your heads with me? Come, Holy Spirit, your servants are listening. Open your word to us. Speak through me that it may not be my words, but yours, God, and show us how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're gonna dive into John 5, and I'm just gonna read the first 13 verses, and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna go through this. Does that sound good? A little teaching lesson today. Sound like fun? 
All right, start in verse one. Sometime after this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a bath with five colonnades around it. It is called in Hebrew Bethesda. In these colonnades, a large number of sick people were lying, blind, lame, and crippled. One man who has been there for 38 years. Jesus saw the man lying there, and finding that he had been in this state a long time, said to him, do you wish to be cured? I have no one, sir, the sick man answered, to put me into the bath when there is a troubling of the water. And while I'm getting to it, someone else steps down before me. Stand up, Jesus said, take up your mat and walk. The man was cured immediately and took up his mat and began walking. Now it was the Sabbath, so the religious authorities said to the man who had been cured, this is the Sabbath, you must not carry your mat. The man who cured me, he answered, said to me, take up your mat and walk. Who was it, they asked, that said to you, take up your mat and walk. But the man who had been restor restored did not know who it was, for Jesus had moved away because there was a large crowd there. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, I love when the church says that. I grew up in a church that did that, so I just I love doing it every now and again, just, just to see who grew up in a church like that. Um, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so I just wanna dive into the word of God today and talk about the pools of Bethesda. So the pools of Bethesda are these, these baths in, in Jerusalem where people would go, and particularly at this pool, there was this water that would spring up. It was kind of like this fresh water spring that would spring up. And the belief at the time was that if you're lame, if you're crippled, if there's any infirmity in your body, if you jumped into the water in time and you're the first one in there, that you'd be healed. And it's so interesting to me because the house of Bethesda is actually called, Bethesda translates to the house of loving kindness. Quick little like, little biblical insight for you. When you think of Beth, like Bethel, um, Bethlehem, Beth means house. So Bethel means house of God, Bethlehem means house of bread, Bethesda means house of loving kindness. And it's so interesting, interesting to me that the house of Bethesda, or these pools of Bethesda, are called the house of loving kindness when they don't really seem loving and kind whatsoever. I mean, there's hundreds. I've, I've been to these pools in Bethesda. It's just this, it's this massive pool. And what I'm picturing in my mind is all these lame, poor, broken people surrounding this pool and then basically fighting each other when it begins to spring up. You know, they're just like punching each other. I gotta get in the water first. Like, that's not kind. That's not loving. That's not gentle. But yet this place is called the house of loving kindness. And what truly breaks my heart is all the broken, hurting people at this time would rather go to a place that's called the house of loving kindness than go to the place that is supposed to be the, love, the house of loving kindness. See, the temple at the time, the church at the time, the Jewish people, the priests, were supposed to be loving and kind. They were supposed to be the people that offered hope. They were supposed to be the people where broken, police, broken people would wanna come to them for healing. Yet, broken and hurting people would go to this place this pool of Bethesda where it was nothing but brokenness. And I have to wonder in our society today how many broken people are scared to come into our churches who would rather go to somewhere that's already broken and filled with other broken people like them rather than find somewhere where they could find hope and find love and find a miracle. I mean, the church is supposed to be a house of miracles, right? We're supposed to be a house of healing. If people are hurting and broken, why wouldn't they wanna come here? Right? That's the question, isn't it? Why don't the broken people in our community want to be healed? Is it their fault? Or are we Pharisees that don't allow them to come in? Right? That's the question today. Stepping on toes already, I love it. Your eyes are like, oh gosh, she called us Pharisees. Uh, no, but we're gonna dive into it today. It's gonna be good, I promise. Just give me a little bit, okay? Uh, so I wanna talk about this lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He had been there for 38 years. That is a long time. For anybody that's 38 years old, I'm not calling you old, but that's a very long time to be sitting at the pools of Bethesda, waiting on your healing, waiting for this thing to happen. He, for his whole, like for 38 years, has been sitting there waiting for healing to happen. He's been sitting there waiting to jump into these waters. 
And you would think that he's been waiting this long that he would be pretty eager to be healed, right? Like he's been waiting forever. Yet Jesus asked a question that when you're reading it, it's kind of like, no, duh, Jesus, of course he wants to be cured, right? In verse six, he says, do you wish to be cured? In the Passion Translation, it says, do you truly long to be healed? And for me, it's like, duh, he's been at the pool for 38 years. Of course he longs to be healed. But I think Jesus was picking up on something. He had been, he'd been there at the pool of Bethesda for so long, hurting, broken, without any hope whatsoever, that when Jesus asks him this question, he doesn't even say yes. He provides an excuse. He says, oh, I can't get in the pool before anybody else. See, this lame man at the pool of Bethesda had come to this place in his life where he was without hope. When Jesus asked him what he'd been longing for for 38 years. I mean, for 38 years, he's been longing for healing. And yet when someone comes right before him and says, do you wish to be healed? He doesn't even have an adequate response. And I think this is reflective of some of our hearts in the sense that we're so hurting, we're so broken. There's so many situations in our lives that we've just seen that are hopeless that when Jesus asks us, do you wanna be healed from that? Can I walk with you through that circumstance with your family member? You don't even know how to respond because it's been hopeless for so long that you think there is no hope. And I wanna tell you this morning that there is hope, that Jesus is with you in your circumstance, that he wants you to take up your mat and walk, that you are not alone no matter how alone you may feel. Your situation is not helpless. Because he, this man at the, at the pool of Bethesda, I think he suffered from something that is called learned helplessness, okay? His life wasn't helpless. Yes, he was in a really difficult circumstance, but yet there was still hope on the other side. But he had been sitting at the pools for so long that he learned that his life was helpless. He learned that nothing was gonna change. He learned that nothing was gonna happen. And I love that Jesus comes in and he says, no, your circumstance is gonna change today. Like this learned helplessness that you've developed in your life is over today. You do not have to be broken forever. And I think that he's saying the same thing in our lives. You may have seen your circumstances helpless. You may have learned it to be helpless because of the years and years and years of hopelessness. But God says that there's hope. There's hope today. The next thing I wanna talk about is really just the significance of this mat. Like, why is this such a big deal? First of all, why does Jesus tell this man to pick up his mat? I find that interesting. He's already healed the man, but he says, take up your mat and walk. Why is it so important that he takes up his mat? Well, a lot of biblical scholars believe that he told him to take up his mat so that if when he brought his mat with him, he wouldn't come back to it later. Because he's been crippled, he's been homeless, he's been at this pool for so long that the pool has truly become his home. This place of hopelessness has truly become where he's find comfort. So when Jesus tells him to take up his mat, he says, no, that's not your home anymore. That's not your identity anymore. That hopeless place that you stayed in for so long, that is not where you belong any longer. You do not have to be there anymore. So when he's saying, take up your mat and walk, he's saying, take up your past and carry it because you are now into a new future with me. You are in a place of healing, a place of hope. You never have to go back to this place of hopelessness. That is not for you any longer. Take up your mat and walk. And then we see as, that he, as he takes up his mat, the Pharisees immediately say, why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? Why are you carrying your mat? Why are you doing this? And what amazes me about that, first of all, is the fact that they didn't know, that the Pharisees didn't know who this man was. The Pharisees were supposed to be the priests at the time, right? They were supposed to be the people that cared for the homeless, the hurting, and the broken. So you would think that a man that's been crippled for 38 years would be someone that they were fairly familiar with, right? They'd be fairly familiar with his story. They'd be fairly familiar with the fact that he's been hurting for so long. It kind of breaks my heart that they don't immediately go, wait, how are you walking? 
Instead, it's, wait, why are you carrying your mat? And this just shows you the heart of the Pharisees at the time, that they cared so much more for their laws and their tradition that they didn't even care for this man that had been lame for 38 years. They didn't care that he had been healed. They didn't care that Jesus had just changed his life forever. All they cared about was their tradition, and it breaks my heart. And Jesus calls them out for this in John uh, chapter five towards the end of it. And I want us to read through this real quick because I gotta say, Jesus is just such a savage. Like, I've just, I've never met someone in my life who just gets away with saying things the way that he does. And it, and it kind of makes me wanna say things like he says them, but I don't think I'd say it with the same grace and compassion that he would. Um, so let's just read through this and let's just laugh at the fact that Jesus is a savage and that he's just so good. Uh, so let's start in verse 37, John 5, 37. We're gonna read the last, last 10 verses of the chapter because it's just so good. The Father who has sent me has himself borne testimony to me. You have neither listened to his voice, not seen his form, and you have not taken this message home to your hearts because you do not believe him who he, has, who he sent as his messenger. You search the scriptures because you think that you find, that, find in them immortal life. And though it is those scriptures that bear testimony to me, you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not receive honor from people, but I know this of you, that you have not the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe in me when you receive honor from one another and do not desire the honor which comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your, your accuser is Moses, on you, whom you have been resting your hopes. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. For it was of me that Moses wrote. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my teachings? Only God. So it cracks me up at the end here. He goes, all right, well, you're such a biblical scholar, right? You've been studying these writings of Moses for literally your entire life, right? Yet when what he is talking about is standing right in front of you, you don't even recognize me. He says, Moses was prophesying about me. Moses was talking about me. Moses, who delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, he spoke of a deliverer that was to come, and that deliverer is me. Yet when I stand right before you, you don't even recognize me. It just amazes me how blind the Pharisees had become in their tradition. And I think what has blinded them so much is that they just have found, in the same way as the lame person, they too are hopeless. And they're hopeless in a different way. And they're hopeless in the sense that they have to control everything. The way I've heard it described, which I thought was a really funny way to describe it, is they have to control the hell out of everything. Kind of funny, right? Like they're literally controlling evil out of a situation when God calls us to surrender those situations to him when we control situations in our lives the way that the Pharisees do, when we try and have a chokehold on these things that God wants us to surrender, we too become Pharisees in the sense that we don't surrender things to him fully. And we become religious and we become hard of heart. And when God wants to move in our lives, we say, oh, well, that's not what my tradition says. That's not what my religion says. That's not what, but God says, but I'm here. And I'm calling you to look for the one to look for the hurting, to look for the broken. Yeah, you might go to the pool of Bethesda and see a crowd of hundreds that are there, but I see the one man that's been there for 38 years and he's broken and he's hurting and he's longing for a touch from heaven. And I think this applies to us more than we realize today. I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon that young people are leaving the church like never before. In fact, by the year 2050, it's estimated that 35 million young people that were raised in the church will leave the church. And I, I brought this same statistic to you the first time I preached here, but I think it's a statistic that we need to be aware of. That's over one million young people every single year until 2050. And on Wednesday night this past week, I brought those statistics to my high school students. We sat outside on this little porch area, about 20 of us, and I basically just asked him a question. And I said, why are young people leaving? 
why don't they find the church a home anymore? Why are they so quick to give up? And what I had them do is actually pretty fun. We broke up into groups of three or four and they gave group presentations like we were in class about why young people are leaving the church. And if you've ever led a high school Bible study before, there's either one of two things that could happen. Either they're just gonna look at you like you're crazy the whole time and not talk, or they're gonna talk about the gossip at their high school or whatever else is going on. There's very few times where you actually get them to like be on topic and actually talk about something. But as soon as I presented this topic, they said, oh, I'm gonna need more than five minutes to present on this. I'm gonna need half an hour. And I went, oh, really? <laughs> and sure enough, in groups of three or four, freshmen to seniors in high school, began to tell me why all their friends are leaving the church. And it broke my heart. They knew exactly why they were leaving. They said the church has become a business. It's become an organization. They care more about numbers. They care more about the money in their pocket than they do the one person. And one that really broke my heart, Sage Marcos, she said, well, the Jesus that I've come to know the Jesus that I've come to know in my secret place, the Jesus I've come to know in my quiet time, just isn't the Jesus that I see in church. It's a foreign Jesus. It's not the Jesus that I've come to know. This is what our young people are saying, that the church does not at all symbolize the Jesus that they know. And I asked them, what makes you stay? What makes you not leave? All your other friends are leaving. Why would you stay? And they say, because we've found hope. And we know that if we stay, maybe our friends will come home. And I was amazed by their response. I was amazed by their compassion. I was amazed by the grace that was in their hearts for their friends that have fallen so far away. So I think there's three options for us this morning. If you're the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, and you're hurting, and you're broken, and you are in a situation that is completely helpless and hopeless, let me tell you today that there is hope, that Jesus is with you in your circumstance, whether you believe it or not. And however long your situation has been hopeless for, he's been there. And I believe today he wants to bring hope. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring restoration. Whether it's for your circumstance or for a family member's circumstance, it's been aching your heart. Number two, if you find yourself to be a Pharisee this morning and you find yourself wanting to control your life in such a way that you don't even find life in your life anymore, surrender, give up control. Give God everything today. Because when you lay your ambition aside, when you lay aside the control that you, need, that you feel like you need to have, that's when the insurmountable peace of Jesus Christ comes. And he goes, finally. You've been holding on to this thing for so long that I didn't even ask you to hold. Let me offer you peace today. And then of course, the third option is to be like Jesus who in a massive crowd found the one person that was so, so broken and offered healing. Let us all embrace the calling of Jesus today, not to be distracted by the crowds, not to be distracted by the numbers, not to seek a massive audience like the young people in this generation say that we do, but go out into the world and find the one that is hurting. Find the one that is lost. Find the one that is desperate for a touch of heaven. That way, one day, the place where the church is supposed to be called a house of miracles will actually be a house of miracles. That we will be the house of loving kindness. That they'll run to this place for healing and hope. They won't run to these other things that aren't gonna offer life for them. They won't run to temporary satisfaction but they'll run into a place where there's a bunch of broken people that have been saved by the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me pray for us this morning.
Jesus, thank you. Thank you that though we have been hopeless, we have found hope in you. Though we have been so caught up in our religion and our tradition that we've sometimes missed you, that you're still calling us back to you. God, I pray today that we would have eyes like Jesus that would seek the lost, seek the hurting, seek the broken, that we would have eyes like you did in this story to offer healing, to offer compassion, to offer grace. Lord, I pray today that the church would once again become a house of loving kindness, a house of hope, a house of miracles, a house that is truly blessed, a place where a broken people would want to come to, that they wouldn't feel judged to walk into this room, but that they would feel loved, that they would feel hope, that they would feel the warm embrace of the Spirit of God when they walk into a space like this. God, I pray that the broken and hurting in our community would be welcomed here, that they'd find healing here, that they'd find restoration and hope here, and that we would go out and bring them home. Jesus' name.